Hello, and welcome to our online worship at Shiloh United Methodist Church. I'm Jerry Suit, the traditional worship coordinator here at Shiloh. We're glad you've tuned in to worship with us on this special day. We hope you're blessed in our time together. Now, let us invite the Lord to be with us in this time of worship. O oh God, in the midst of the cacophony of voices that crush our spirit and deny our calling, voices that say, who do you think you are? We come to hear your voice of affirmation. We come to hear your voice calling us to be and do what you have called us to be and do. Let this time of worship quiet our fears, soothe our bruised souls, and energize us for ministry in and with your beloved world. Let faith abide. Let hope abide. Let love abide here in this sanctuary, here in our community, here in our world, but most of all, here in us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today's scripture lesson comes from Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 10. Now hear the lesson. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his holy word.
Welcome to this message entitled Save. It is based on Psalm 71, first six verses. This psalm is a prayer of deliverance from enemies. From all that we can tell, the psalmist has returned to Jerusalem after living in Babylon for 40 years. So when he marched to Babylon, he was young, but he returns an old person while Jerusalem is under Persian rule. And when he returns to his homeland, it is in a dangerous situation there. These words, in you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O oh my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel. For you, O oh Lord, are my hope, my trust. O oh Lord, from my youth, upon you I have leaned from my birth. It was you who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God for his holy word. When I was in Israel in 1984, our guide, Saad Shar, was a Palestinian Christian. He lived in Jerusalem. One evening, he got to talking and he remembered his family being cast out of their home in 1948 when he was just a boy, when the Jews from all over Europe came to Israel for resettlement. It was sobering to hear his pain over the loss of the family home and the fear that was all connected to that event. You see, there are winners and losers when two groups feel they have rights to the same portion of land. The return to Jerusalem was not glorious for the first exiles. It was a tiny group that came back from Babylon, those first exiles, to Jerusalem. They had been released by an edict from Cyrus the Persian emperor who had conquered Babylon and allowed then the Jews to begin to return home. And so our psalmist most likely is among the first to come back. Now can you imagine the excitement 
of returning to your home after being forced from it 40 years earlier. It had been prophesied that they would return to Israel. And so they do. But when they arrive, they find their homeland still in ruins and many people occupying it who were not there before. Some of their homes that were left standing were occupied by Palestinian Jews who had not been carried off into exile, but had remained there during the 40 years. They simply moved in and took over where they could. But there were also Gentiles living in the land and Samaritans. Some of those who returned found their property all destroyed nothing to return to. Others found new homes in the place of their old homes. Instead of being welcomed home by everyone, they were seen as a threat and as intruders. People had lived there for years without them. And so when they moved back, there were struggles about who could keep what was there. As if that's all not enough, all historians say that the crops failed in the areas of Jerusalem and surrounding it The crops failed the first several years when the exiles returned. So then the bare necessities were difficult to come by. The psalmist describes himself, and Psalm 70 is linked to Psalm 71. It's the introduction, you could say, to Psalm 71. And in that psalm, The psalmist says, I am poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. The word poor there implies that he he doesn't have any land. And so this psalmist is in a bad way. Furthermore, they are now still under Persian rule. And so they can't determine completely what goes on in their country. Some of the exiles who return want to rebuild the temple as soon as possible. Others do not because they don't have enough to eat, let alone rebuild the temple. But those who feel that God wants the temple rebuilt, go ahead. And they don't get very far. Over a course of a number of years, only the foundation is laid. And finally, work has to cease. There simply aren't the resources to carry out the rebuilding of the temple. And they get no help. So there is division within the community itself, those exiles who come back. There's division within them about what should be their focus. Should it be the temple? Should it be their personal safety? Should it be uh, establishing um, other means of worshiping God? And so it's all in disarray. There are marauding bands of thieves in the area. And so the psalmist has 
plenty of enemies. It is not a safe place in Jerusalem. The psalmist is full of stress and grief. Throughout the psalm, the psalmist says things like this. You are my hope, O God. Rescue me from the hand of the wicked, the grasp of the unjust, and the cruel. Do not cast me off in my old age. Do not forsake me when my strength is spent. My enemies speak concerning me. And those who watch for my life consult together. There is nothing quite like fear and the lack of security to cause one to have deep stress and grief. The psalmist literally fears for his life. Now, when I think of my life and I compare it to the psalmist, there's no comparison. I can't imagine being taken from my home, forced to march hundreds upon hundreds of miles to serve a foreign people, live there for 40 years, then able to return, and when I get back, find my home is occupied by someone else, and I have no means to provide for myself. And plus, there are people out to kill me. Who of us here could compare ourselves to the psalmist in this life? It's bad for this psalmist. No wonder the psalmist is grieving. And so, how do we apply this to us? Our lives often are a piece of cake when compared to this. But of course, we can all be overwhelmed. We can all have difficulties. Our health can be taken in a moment, or the health of someone we love. We can uh, find ourselves not equipped to do something and realize it's not going to happen. Like the psalmist, we can get our expectations high about something and think this is going to be simple and wondrous only to find out that life has a way of smashing our expectations. We can lose work. We can lose money. We can lose a lot in this life. Life is difficult and hard. All of us face stress and grief. The other day, the battery in my wife's car uh, went kerplunk. I was able to jump it the first time and get it running for a while and drove it around and hoped that would solve the problem. It did not solve the problem. It was not merely that a light was left on in the car like I presumed or something like that. The battery was simply at the end of its life. So I needed to replace the battery, and I pulled up the hood to look at it, 
I couldn't even tell where the bat, which which box uh, was the battery. Um, this uh, vehicle is one of those uh, stop-start vehicles. So when you come to a stop, it it goes off, and then it automatically turns on when you apply the gas and take your foot off the brake. And so there were so many things hooked up to this battery. I didn't know I could face it. So I called the Chevrolet dealer and made an appointment for the next day. And then I got up to drive it over there and I tried to jump it as I had successfully done the previous day, only the car would not start. It would not be jumped. The battery was completely dead. Now what was I going to do? So I decided I needed to change the battery myself. Now I'm no mechanic, but I've changed batteries in cars all my life. And it used to be you just had to do three steps. Unhook the positive lead and the negative lead and then unhook where the batteries bolted to the car. That was it. Not so with this battery. There were 15 steps just to get the battery out of the car. I had to get on the internet to figure out how to do it and find a tutorial on how to take this battery out. And so I'm doing this. And I'm frustrated. And I drop a socket into the engine by mistake. Now I have to get this socket out from the engine, but I can't reach it. It takes me 30 minutes to retrieve the socket. Then I try to get the battery locally. It is not available. It is a special battery. I have to go to the Chevrolet dealer to get it 30 minutes away. And so I do. The battery costs $287. And I put it in. It's as difficult to put back in as it was to take out. This took an entire better part of a day for me. And by the time it's over, I am a nervous wreck. <laughs> I was successful. The car did start. I had to reprogram a few things that were lost because of the lack of electricity to the engine. But there it was, it all went okay. But it reminds us that stress can happen in a moment. Something that seems to be simple suddenly turns into something else. I wonder if the psalmist felt, I'm going home. I'll get back to my home. I'll have to do some repairs, but I'm going to be living back among my beloved people at home. Sounded simple, but it wasn't. Whether we have real enemies or not, whether we struggle financially or not, whether we have family problems or not, life will challenge us. Something will stress us out. Something will bring us to grief and fear. Whether we have our health or not, all of these things become occasions 
when we're up against something we don't know how to do. All of these become occasions to rely upon God. Let's see how the psalmist handles his dangerous situation. He proclaims that God is his refuge. In other words, God becomes the sheltering one of protection. He is going to rely upon God to protect him. He is going to say that. He proclaims that God is the one who made him, and God gave him birth from his mother's womb. And so he has trusted God all his life, and it's not a time to stop trusting now. He is moved to prayer, to pray. You know, at one point during this uh, battery deal, I had a part and I had laid it on the engine um, or the front part of the car above the radiator. And when I went back to retrieve it, I couldn't find it. Took me 10 minutes to find. I became a person of prayer at that moment. God, I'm about to lose it. Help me find this part. I searched 10 minutes for the part, thinking I'd left it somewhere else, not where I put it. Finally, I am feeling along to see where this part is. And then something wobbles. The part had gone and fit exactly into a spot, and it looked like it was part of a car. No wonder I missed it. But for a moment there, God became my refuge. I needed eyes and ears and touch beyond my own to be able, seemingly, to do the most simple. Now I know we have to watch this, that God just becomes our, our rescuer for everything. There are some things I'm sure we need to do on our own. But I'm not so sure that God doesn't want us to realize that God is our first place of refuge. That God is the one who can save us. That God desires to share our stress, our trauma, our relationship problems, our employment problems, our health concerns. God desires to share. So, the psalmist puts all of this, including his enemies. So there are people who are out to get the psalms. They're watching him for an opportunity. And he puts all of that into the hands of God in prayer. God is the one he trusts. And one of the things I noticed in this psalm, and it's not everywhere in the Bible, but this psalmist refuses to take vengeance into his own hands. He's not going to amass his own little army or get his uh, um, weapons together He's going to trust in God. Now, maybe he'll be wise about his movements. Maybe he'll be with people more often than alone. But he trusts that God can save him. And vengeance is left to God. 
You know, our culture is obsessed with vengeance. We want to even the score on every international incident. We want to even the score when someone hurts us. We want them to feel as much hurt back. So many movies are devoted to one thing, revenge. Our culture is obsessed with it. But vengeance properly belongs to God. In our hands, it gets out of control. One time, I was deeply hurt by a friend. And I had a dream after it because I had troubling thoughts about this friend. In the dream, my friend hurts me. And I decide to hurt my friend back in the exact same way. So in the dream, my friend hurts me physically, and so I hurt my friend back physically in the dream. It was exactly even, just like the Bible says in one place, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, that kind of thing. It was exactly even in the dream. But after I hurt my friend, then suddenly the authorities are going to come after me. And so I run and I hide. Now, the authorities seem to know where I'm going. And where I'm at in a hiding place, they send a group of children in to find me, which seems rather odd. One child finds me, and the child comes up to me and tags me, and then runs off. I take this into the dream to mean that the child is going to tell on me, and so now, I'm going to be caught. This disturbs me so much, I run out of my hiding place and I decide my life is over and that I must jump off a cliff. And I run to the cliff and right before I jump off, I wake up. <laughs> Perhaps you've had dreams like this. But the dream is instructive. I think God was saying, you can't get even. Even when you think you do, your soul will not allow it. You will end up running, hiding, and eventually punishing yourself. Now, God shows up in the dream. God is the child. Often, children represent a beautiful innocence, a purity in dreams. Sometimes, they simply glow and this child tags me and runs off now why did children tag someone and run off well you know the answer to that it's uh, the game of tag tag you're it and then what am what is the person who's tagged supposed to do? Run after the other person who tagged you and tag them back. 
God was inviting me out of my predicament, out of my obsession with my hurt, to play with God. You see, how often do we use God as a means of punishment? We want God to punish someone else or ourselves. I think God would rather be intimate, would rather be with us in a way that brings delight and joy. I think God would rather play. God tags us to be our refuge, to save us, not only from external in enemies, but internal ones as well. Amen. Let us pray together. God, you are our deliverer, our refuge. In you, we can find the protection that we need the resources we need to be free. And we ask that we would live according to your truth and that we would not condone injustice, but stand up for what is right. That God, you would save us from fear and shame and from being dominated and yet keep in us humility and patience to be generous with all in this world who need you. We pray that you would release your resources, O oh God, that this world can be drawn to yourself and that we, as your representatives here on earth, would live according to the way of Christ and share all that you want of us with those in need. In your name we pray, amen.
God, we just thank you <laughs> for this time that we got to come together and listen to your word and your song, Father God. I just ask that you would bless this time, bless the people listening, Father God. We know that you have them in your hands, Father. I just thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing in the unseen, God. I just ask that you would continue to work on our behalf, God. Um, I thank you that I am changed, and I hope you are changed too. And he continues to change us. He loves us too much to keep us the same. So go ahead and grasp onto his truth today. Um, and I look forward to seeing you sometime, whether it be with a mask or right back on here. So thanks for joining Shiloh today. Have a blessed week. See you next week.